Good morning. If everyone, uh, I'd like to go ahead and start because we have a lot to talk about and very little time in which to do it. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today for the domestic surveillance panel. I'm Jessalyn Radak, the Homeland Security Director at the Government Accountability Project. And I'm also the Justice Department whistleblower in the case of the American Taliban, John Walker Lind, if you remember that. I blew the whistle when evidence of my advice to provide him counsel was disregarded and then disappeared. In the aftermath of blowing the whistle, I was too busy fending off criminal investigations, bar referrals, and dealing with the inconveniences of being on the no-fly list to think much about the warrantless wiretapping aspect of my case. My antenna were raised when the Columbia Journalism Review wrote an article on my case entitled, Who's Tracking Your Calls? And how far will the Justice Department go to burn a leaker? The article, which described my case as creepy, <laughs> detailed how the Justice Department got hold of my phone records and the phone records of Newsweek reporter Michael Isikoff without either of us knowing it. That was in 2003, years before we knew about the secret surveillance program. I wish I could say that the domestic spying program is an old relic of the Bush administration, but it's alive and well today. As a senator, President Obama voted against the amendment providing telecom immunity, but ultimately voted in favor of the new FISA bill. As president, he has promised greater transparency and delivered on some of those promises yet argued that the state secret's privilege is a good enough reason to stop one of the only viable lawsuits over the government's eavesdropping program. To talk about these issues today, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists. Tom, Tam hardly needs an introduction after being on the cover of Newsweek a few weeks ago. Um, he has been a prosecutor at the local and federal level for over 25 years. And he worked in the Department of Justice as a trial attorney for numerous years before becoming an attorney with the Office of Intelligence and Policy Review, an office you probably have never heard of. However, he was one of the attorneys who regularly appeared before the FISA court from April 2003 to March 2004, and I'll let him tell you his story, but by blowing the whistle, he literally changed history and blew the lid off the Bush administration's secret surveillance program. Mark Rotenberg, who's to my right, um, is the executive director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center in, here in DC. He also teaches information privacy law at Georgetown University and has testified before Congress and before the 9-11 Commission on numerous issues, including access to information, computer security, and communications privacy. Wes McLeod Ball, also on my left, next to Tom, is the Chief Legislative and Policy Counsel for the ACLU Washington Legislative Office. He manages a team of policy councils and lobbyists who work with congressional offices to ensure that American civil liberties are preserved and protected. All of these people have been on the forefront of dealing with domestic surveillance. Um, and so I'd like for each of them to talk about their own stories and what they're doing, and then we'll get into a more general discussion with some specific questions. Um, first, I'd like to call Tom Tam and what is his first public appearance, um, and thank him for his bravery um, in, in speaking to you all today.
Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the uh, Government Accountability Project for asking me, and Jesslyn in particular. Uh, I kind of chuckled when I heard that I might be recognizable because I was on the cover of Newsweek. This uh, professional photographer uh, flew down from New York. Uh, he had actually just two weeks earlier done a beautiful picture, cover picture of uh, Barack Obama. Uh, but he flew down with uh, three of his assistants and took at least 300 pictures of me in my house, some of which were the camera was about six inches away. And I, you know, I was kind of thinking, if you're all that good a photographer, how come you need to take so many pictures? But I, I didn't mention that to him. But anyway, I said, any reason? And he said, well, they want to make this dramatic. So uh, the Newsweek uh, cover shows a black background and kind of just a partial view of my face. And I think I'm totally unrecognizable, uh, which was a good thing, because maybe the FBI would not be able to identify me. Um, 9 11 actually changed my perception of a lot of uh, things. I was working in the death, death penalty unit for the U.S. Department of Justice. In other words, I was a capital case litigator. I had helped try the first uh, federal capital case in the Southern District of Alabama. And as a result of 9 11, with regard to the Massawi uh, prosecution, uh, when we were considering whether to seek the death penalty against Mr. Massawi, I had uh, two kind of uh, different but interesting and uh, worthwhile experiences. I went up to talk with the victims' families, uh, the families of the victims of 9-11 in New York. A, a group of us did that. We were, I mean, it was uh, really actually heartwarming and they comforted me a lot more than I comforted them. Um, I actually wear a, a lapel pin in honor of, uh, in memory of them. Uh, and also in, uh, to remind me that we have not caught bin Laden or al Zarhari. Um, and uh, at the same time, we were tasked to go to the CIA and the State Department to look through classified cables for any Brady material, which is exculpatory, exculpatory material that there might be in any of the evidence collected by all these massive uh, federal agencies. And it was at the CIA that I uh, read about uh, various people being, uh, it's a really a great word, it's rendered, which I think also means like what they do to horses, uh, but uh, rendered to countries that uh, we all knew and it was kind of implicit in the cables uh, about torture, that they would be tortured. And what troubled me about that, at first I thought, well, they're gonna get what they deserve. But then I would hear our government saying that we didn't do that. And so that really bothered me. But out of patriotic fervor, I went over to the FISA court, thinking rather than death penalty cases, I wanted to go after the people that had done this to us. And as I was there, appearing before the FISA court, and let me say that the people that work there, my former colleagues, are very bright, very conscientious. The vast majority, if not all of them, believe in the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and they were all very concerned about probable cause. But as I was there, I noticed that there was like a subset of cases that went before just one particular judge and could only be signed by the Attorney General of the United States. Not the Deputy Attorney General, who is a boss of mine. Uh, not even the CIA Director. It was only the Attorney General of the United States. And so I started trying to analyze so what was different between which cases went that track and which cases went the normal FISA track. And I actually had the opportunity to like compare applications and I couldn't tell any difference. So between the two and what that meant to me was that somebody had cleaned whatever was in the document that was going to what we called the program or what was called the program in kind of a Kafkaesque uh, kind of reference uh, was not, I, what actually struck me was the lack of evidence in, in those applications essentially. And I couldn't figure out why we had to do these things differently. And as I thought about it, I talked to some people, anybody know what the program is? And, and one senior person said, no, I just assume that what they're doing is illegal. Uh, so I don't want to know what they're doing. And as you heard, I grew up in a law enforcement family, uh, you know, always thought I wore the white hat, truth, justice, the American way. Um, and I didn't like the fact that I might be doing something illegal.